Next up, we've got Dr. Manuela Veloso, head of AI research at JP Morgan, previously the head of machine learning at Carnegie Mellon University. She'll be speaking about AI for intelligent financial services. Now, AI has a huge range of potential in financial services from NLP through to financial market simulation, even detecting financial fraud. And it's a massively growing industry as people try and get the edge across each other. Dr. Veloso draws on her deep background in academic research and her experience in co-founding the RoboCup robotics competition to inform her work. So I'm super excited to welcome her here today for the second keynote. So hi, um, I'm very pleased to be here uh, telling you a little bit about AI for intelligent financial services. And it will just be a set of brief examples and some thoughts. And uh, I am actually currently the, uh, the head of JP Morgan Chase AI research. And I'm on leave from uh, Carnegie Mellon University, where I was, uh, where I am the Herb Simon University professor in the School of Computer Science. So I just want to first mention very briefly that AI is a young science. AI is a discipline that started somehow in the early 1900s, 30s with Alan Turing, and then in 56, there was this conference. And the interesting thing about this uh, conference in particular, which was proposed through this text that we are looking at, this is one of the paragraphs, is that it tried to uh, capture all, all, every aspect, all aspects of learning and any feature of intelligence could in principle be so precisely described that the computer could do it. So there was this concept of embracing all intelligence. Therefore, AI became and is still a science of components. So, you know, uh, we have the natural language process, we have speech recognition, we have machine vision, we have all sorts of like decision making and reasoning uh, algorithms for planning, for search, for learning, for representing knowledge. So, and then the actual execution, the human AI interaction, the continuous learning through feedback. So somehow AI has all these different kind of components exactly because the goal is to capture every aspect of learning, every facet of intelligence. So this is what I first wanted to share, this concept of like these uh, uh, component-based kind of thinking of AI, but it's very interesting when we try to put it all together. So uh, at JP Morgan Chase, we have been as AI research trying to pursue some long aspirational goals. And I just shared this with you to put into context then the examples that, that I will share. So these aspirational goals are organized according to the financial domain to try to see how AI can predict and affect economic systems, how can it help to liberate data safely and accurately, and how to eradicate financial crime. And then there is this very beautiful set of like also aspirational goals uh, related to our stakeholders in terms of seeing how AI can empower employees, AI to perfect client experience and AI to actually like help with policy compliance and, and uh, an overarching goal of trying to have this AI be uh, ethical and socially good, establishing ethical and socially good AI. So I'm just going to um, highlight a few projects, a few examples within these different aspirational goals. Uh, and then I'll finish uh, giving you a website where we discuss many more projects. So here we go. Uh, so I'm going to try, I'm going to start by telling you about a very beautiful kind of like a project, very beautiful kind of like AI uh, algorithm to uh, basically um, as a translation of representation, basically having humans interact with uh, uh, this docu-bot, this uh, bot to produce documents and uh, in order to empower AI, to empower our employees. So let's think about the problem of actually generating PowerPoint slides in particular, a report that is actually in the form of charts, of language, of all sorts of different uh, amounts of data that needs to be captured. So we have this DocuBot, what it does is that actually it enables humans to really uh, is express express um, commands or express uh, desires and uh, uh, things that need to be done 
uh, in language. So we can say add a slice with the title satisfaction scores of clients and basically insert an histogram, use column C. So you can instruct this DocuBot to do all sorts of like uh, uh, actions. And then what is in particular AI PPTX, which is a form of DocuBot of, the, of this uh, bot that generates PowerPoint slides, is able to map that language into actually skills that then are executed and the outcome is produced. So I'll give you an example by showing you a video of these DocuBot in action. And basically this is like, a, 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 I'm going to, to, I'm saying this. So it, this is an example in which I want to show you how actually this DocuBot basically interacts with a human. And currently here is on the command line, we are developing a uh, much, much more uh, uh, friendly user interface. But the interesting thing is that it does say like this, how can I help you today, DocuBot says. And the user says, look, in English, in actually language, in this particular case, no, no specific structure, it's all parsed, please run the execution analysis template for some kind of like company. And these slides, this actual, how do you say, representation of the data, is automatically generated by DocuBot, including the the, in the, the, the the language insights associated with this particular kind of analysis. So this is an automation process that DocuBot does, but then it adds more. So this intelligence comes from this further interaction with the user. It can uh, uh, it can execute changes. So if the, the, the user says, change the color of the figures and uh, uh, what else should I do? Center the figure. And here there is something I want, I'm going to stop just to, to show you something very interesting in terms of like these um, continuous learning aspect. So when the user says, send the, center the figure title, the actual, Algorithm DocuBot does not know whether center the figure title uh, in its knowledge applies to all the figures or just to a specific figure. So it asks, shall I make the change for all the figures or a specific figure? The user says all and DocuBot now has a parameter which is eventually all or just one filled in by this additional dialogue. So the, the algorithm is able to identify the needs for further refinement of the information and then is able to execute uh, all these, uh, these uh, types of like uh, changes. And I would like to emphasize again that there are three different types of changes that uh, DocuBot can uh, execute. First, it can actually execute uh, uh, changes related just to the appearance of those slides, center the figure, change the color. Then it can actually uh, make corrections related to the content of how the data is processed and represented, modify the number of levels from four to eight. And then it has a third level of corrections or of, uh, commands it can take, which is save the previous three instructions. So now uh, you give like instructions of format, instructions of content and instructions of storage and DocuBot is in this uh, interaction with the user and learning in fact to, uh, uh, to perform these commands. And so you keep seeing that now if we would be like looking at these uh, more carefully, it's centered the, the titles, change the color, of all the figures and eventually it actually increased the, 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 the number of levels from four to eight if we would look at this more carefully. And then finally, the last example I'll show is that it actually can add uh, uh, more uh, uh, to this template, to this kind of like a macro uh, uh, that it knows about. It can add now, it asks, could you please add a heat map chart of the imbalance time series data at the end of the report. And there you go, the, robot, the, the DocuBot executes again the slides, which are these, these set of slides, and it has the actually heat map at the end. So, and then finally it can save this. So it's very important to understand that this AI architecture is able to interact with the user. So it has a user interface as a summary, it, which takes language, natural language. It has a parser that uses that, uh, that goes through this language and is able to map 
uh, the actions extracted from the language into actions for execution. And in fact, and it uses some knowledge base that can map the language to the to the their its skills and its uh, execution skills, so that eventually, if something doesn't match, it it's always learning. It asks for uh, what is this, and it increases this knowledge base in a continuous learning manner. And then eventually, you can do the document generation and the insight, the language generation, also through a learning from humans, what is the important language. In the, in the, the, the video, in this demo, I showed a kind of lock, docubot already at a stage in which it was not interacting and asking for everything and learning from interaction from the beginning. So it was at a stage that in particular only asked about whether to center the figure in or all the figures. So, uh, so that was the basically what it asked for, and the and then eventually outputs uh, something automatically. So the big thing about these um, uh, these docubot is that in some sense uh, it uh, it is like um, an end to end uh, an AI kind of like a, a system that does the language, does the execution, and does the the continuous learning. So uh, this is the first example I gave you, and uh, it's being uh, at JP Morgan. We have been using DocuBot for several, several, several uh, types of use cases and several types of documents, not just PowerPoint, but also Word documents and text documents. It uh, it only it only matters which skills are used in this mapping engine from requests to actually uh, execution. Okay, so this was the first example. And I mentioned just as a summary, so I mentioned AI as components of intelligence. I mentioned very briefly the AI, the JP Morgan AI research goals. And I mentioned to you J DocuBot. And now I'm just going to go through three other very fast, three other kind of like examples of AI and, uh, and in finance that we, uh, and then I'll conclude. So just, Bear with me. So this very this uh, Sphinx algorithm that I'll mention in a second is actually fascinating in terms of data. So you know, financial data, surprisingly and uh, also challenging in a challenging way, is represented in you know in a, a tremendous variety of formats. You, know, you can uh, uh, put the values all in some column. You can put the values by row. You can specify periods uh, in different ways. Year, January. You can make it like the title of the column be the period. I mean, it's like overwhelming to uh, to use this data in so many different formats. So what we did was that under the following assumptions that in fact, uh, all the data was in an Excel format, it was numeric data. So for example, uh, prices, percentages, growth rates, inventories, any type of numerical data. I'm sorry that parenthesis is out of place. And there were two types of metadata that we assumed that there was always in the data, a time period and a metric or a hierarchy of metrics. So in this example here, the time period would be here January 07 or uh, March 19. And the metrics would be like rates and inflation, which is what it says in one of the columns and a submetric, uh, the hierarchy of metrics, then it would say effective federal, uh, federal funds rate or 3M li LIBOR or inflation, so real PC PCE and so forth. So these are like um, metrics that uh, as we call, that are hierarchically organized. So if the data was able to, is able to comply with these assumptions, then Sphinx, which is this algorithm that's, that is able to uh, do a standard financial data extraction beautifully uses, and again, like the power of like AI systems to uh, understand uh, representation. So here, uh, uh, Sphinx uses visual and stylistic cues like horizontal and vertical alignments, left indentation, font size, and semantic cues, like for example, three months ended uh, 30, September 30th is a time period, months uh, ended 
the, the actual dates and the revenue, which appears here is actually a financial metric. So a lot of like semantic understanding through natural language training that is able to extract these uh, from the data represented, extract a lot of like information. And it emulates all these cues to convert the data into a standard format. So the beautiful thing is that uh, the Sphinx output, so this is a very data intensive process. So to address this frustration of all the multiple formats and Sphinx is able to transform, uh, you know, we tried in many different formats that comply with those assumptions into a standardized representation in which the metrics and the submetrics and the sub submetrics as many as needed and the periods that start and end with a particular value of a particular type and of a particular uh, scale are saved. So for example, 2187, which is this number over here, becomes a row in this column, in this file. And that's another example, a completely different file. Again, this macroeconomic file on rates and inflection that we saw before. Again, how do you say unfolded or, or uh, um, you know, represented now in a standardized form. Another example, completely different, like, unemployment rates in Illinois or uh, any other type of like numerical data, again, unfolded into metrics, submetrics, periods and time and values and types. All of these extracted automatically. So Sphinx is code that is, if you are interested in mail me and I, then my email will be at the end, that is available as Python code with the Python model. And, more, and interestingly also, it can generate that Excel format that is standardized, but it also can generate other types of outputs such as JSON and TSV, okay? So this is the second example. The third example, and I'm getting close to the, the time and I'm going to finish in a second, is about like jumping now into like a AI to, uh, uh, to, how do you say, to predict and affect economic systems. While we, the one uh, Sphinx is a part of our AI to actually liberate uh, data safely and accurately and automatic and autonomously, so we had first AI to em to uh, to empower our own employees with DocuBot. I gave an example of Sphinx as a, a way for the AI to process data automatically. And now I'm going just to give very briefly an example of indeed this uh, uh, agent-based uh, simulation of markets. And the reason why I'm mentioning this, it's because by representing these very complex uh, market uh, uh, domains in simulation as agents, we are able, actually able to have two things. First, we are able to create agents that can learn to play in this market according to uh, calibrated by real data and according to the rules of the game of these kind of market and trying to optimize rewards that we may want to include in the system. But most importantly also, because we have this simulation, according to the rules and the regulations of the markets, you are able to, we are able to generate uh, simulated data of very kind of like um, different nature that is all legal and enables us to uh, delve into the, this world of synthetic data. So I want you to understand that we have been able to uh, generate synthetic data, a financial data of multiple nature. So we are able to anonymize data. We are able to sample from learned models using GANs, but we are also able to do this uh, agent-based simulation, which I just showed to you in a bytes very briefly. So uh, in conclusion, uh, I just want to mention that we have a variety of other projects like learning uh, customer satisfaction, uh, pro detection and prevention of financial crime, uh, regulation and compliance, fairness in markets, ethics and values, and also trying to uh, overall uh, uh, try to perfect this client experience. So uh, in conclusion, uh, these, uh, these uh, work at, at the JP Morgan AI research is, the, is, um, is shared as publications, academic publications. And I want to basically also mention that if you go to the website jpmorgan.com slash AI, you'll have access to 
uh, both the projects that we uh, we share with the community the, through publications and uh, open source code when it, uh, and synthetic data. You will see the pointer to the synthetic data. There are more than uh, there are uh, dozens of, of external and internal people using our synthetic data. And uh, we'll be very happy to uh, provide this to you as you, uh, if you have an interest and you can email me at jpmorganchase.com or also go to my website, veloso.html, which has publications related to um, AI in general and in particular to the projects that uh, uh, we have uh, carried at JP Morgan. So uh, thank you very much for the attention and I look forward to hearing from you.